Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the House of Bloodstein Mentralysis Part 3, Chapter 5, Gomes Bedroom. When we last jawed, our intrepid adventurers, Lord Philip and his new bride, Thomasina the 19th of Wham, had penetrated deep into the Gellertron at Castle Bloodstein, finding at last the Chadburn hidden in a pile of junk, essentially. And they also discovered the infamous Clara Wonderluck imprisoned nearby, and of course, Clara messed things up a little bit. The Manx came because she was making such a racket and they saw the open Gellertron door and then closed it, essentially stranding Philip and Thomasina somewhere in the universe. They have no idea where. Clara mentions that she, she knows how to get to Baz from where they are, but then that means they have to take her with them. They get her out of the jail. Thomasina's not very nice to her. They encounter a whole pot full of minks and discover the blood box in a locked secure location that they can't get into yet clara knows the combination opens the door thomasina goes in destroys all the nastiness within they defeat the manx and then they discover a mystical doorway that goes right into queen gomes bower chest monster right into her bedroom on the other side of this door is her bedroom and that's where we left off this is a slightly shorter chapter than last week so let's just dig right in. Part three, chapter five, Gomes bedroom. Inside was what appeared to be a small but opulent bedchamber. The walls were hammered brass, sloping up to a convex ceiling of lapis and beryl, studded with gleaming jewels arranged to resemble a starry night sky. The grand bed was spread with the finest silks. The posts made of the rarest woods. The hardwood floor was pebbled with fitted smooth blue, red, and green gemstones like inviting candy. On a nightstand, scented candles peacefully floated in golden bowls of clean water. Soft incense smoke drifted out of jade burners. By the bed, light from a splendid lantern created a warm halo. A muted throbbing like the workings of great machinery pulsed with a reliable beat throughout the room. It was a surprisingly serene and tranquil place where an immortal tyrant slept safe from Rothaba of George and her mentralysis waves. The room felt slightly unsteady under their feet, as if they were floating on water or possibly flying through the air. A door creaked open and light spilled across the floor. A thin, partially clad woman glistening with oil and scented powders emerged from an adjacent chamber, bearing an armload of folded linens. She stopped and looked about in surprise. What are you doing in here? She said to Clara in an ugly tone. Ha! I got my buddies here with me this time, Clara said as Philip covered her with his poltava. Guess I won't be working on the fraggin' cistern today, will I, you wretched nudie bug? The woman saw Thomasina carrying the bloody Chadburn and Philip with his drawn poltava. P Please, she stammered, still holding the linens. I, I don't know who you are or what this woman has told you. I'm simply a servant of the great Queen Gome. I am Alana, her, her body servant. I have served her all my life. She's a rotten, bossy, mankin' bitch, Clara roared. Let's knock her out. Philip waved Clara off. He lowered his gun and spoke kindly to Alana. Come, put your things down. Please, you needn't fear. We shall not harm you. However, we must unfortunately unfortunately inconvenience you for several hours at least. Clara rolled her eyes. Oh, come on! You're too nice. A real fudging you are, Philip. Let's take this bitch down. She's dangerous and I owe her one right across the chops. Please be quiet, Philip responded. Eyes wide, Alana nodded. Yes, yes, I'll do whatever you ask. Could you do us the courtesy of putting some clothing on, Thomasina said, noting her oiled body covered with only a few scant swatches of light fabric. Alana tried to cover herself. I, I am sorry, this is how we all dress. It, it is her will to deter us from stealing. I will cover myself. She put her linens down on the bed and pulled one off 
off the top, unfolding it. How many servants of Gom are nearby? Philip asked as Alana unfolded the linen. Without warning, she dropped the linens and sprang at Philip, hands raised, her palms glittering with small, painted-on circles of colorful powder. We are many, she roared with sudden ferocity. King rose up to attack. Clara seized a golden bowl from the nightstand, scattering the water and candles, and swung, hitting Alana across the bridge of the nose. <laughs> Bang! Alana fell. Claire was ecstatic. She threw the bowl down. Hell yeah! Gods have been waiting to do that to one of these naked frag wagons for a while now. How do you like me now, babe? Ha! Guess you ain't pretty no more, huh? Philip and Thomasina stood there staring at the fallen woman. Creation, she had me fooled, he said. Thomasina scolded her husband. You must be more calculating, Philip. I was suspecting treachery from the beginning. Never trust a strange naked woman of all things. Told you she's a bitch, Clara said, standing over Alana's body. And guess what, Philip? I just saved your life right now. I'm certain I could have safely restrained her. Clara raised one of Alana's hands. Her palms and knuckles were coated with dots of festive color. Oh yeah? See this? This is Aboleth. It's an explosive powder Queen Gomes invented from those magnificent plants she cultivates. It's pretty awesome stuff. Queen Gome and her attendants paint themselves with it all the time, and they aren't afraid to cut loose when they need to. You think they're all cute and naked, totally disarmed, right? Oh no, 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 you don't want to get hit with this stuff, Philip. Philip was puzzled. Alana's body was covered in festive dots and swirls of various colors. How so? The stuff explodes just a little bit and they can blow your head off without injuring themselves in the process. I kept trying to steal some and blow the door off my cell, but this naked dead Rita here always made me wash off. We've seen explosions from the Manx before we made our way through the Gellertron, Thomasina said. Was it coming from this dust? Yep. Clara pointed at the door Alana had emerged from. She's got some in there if you want to see it. Philip looked about the room. Wait a moment. What about Queen Gome? Where can we expect to encounter her? This is her bedchamber, correct? Yep, Clara said. I'm pretty certain she's not around right now. If she was here, we'd know it. There'd be tons of these naked ladies running around all over the place. She doesn't do anything for herself. The naked ladies do it all. I'm amazed they don't chew her food for her. Philip nodded. All right, I suppose we're fortunate she's not here. Show us this powder. I'll, I'll take care of the girl. He lifted her off the floor, blood dripping from a deep gash over her nose. Clara led them through the door to a vast bathing area. It was like that wonderful spa they had enjoyed in Fazo after they were wed. A colossal mosaic of Queen Gome, sitting on a golden throne being worshipped by a throng of people and served by a host of naked females loomed over a number of wading pools. There were heated pools reeved and feathery steam, mineral baths, bubbling pools, colored tincture waters, and cool pools of clear water to wash off the water from the previous pools. The whole place smelled of aqua chemicals, clean water, and minerals. A grand boudoir with a dizzying collection of pots and jewel-encrusted urns full of powders, salves, oils, perfumes, and other accessories was situated in an alcove before a full-length mirror. Thomasina took a moment to wash off the gold from the blood box, dipping into a pool and cleaning herself and the Chadburn. Clara selected several golden pots and set them aside. Better wash that slut off to get rid of the Aboleth in case she wakes up, Clara said. Philip took Alana to a pool and dipped her in. The squirrels and dots of color quickly dissolved in the water. So, Clara said, this first pot here is the actual Aboleth itself. She removed the lid. Inside was a pinkish crystalline powder that looked like fine sea salt. Clara removed the lids from the other pots, revealing pigments of various shades and a thick gel-like substance. These here are dyes to shade the Aboleth however you like. Once you have it the color you want, you mix it with this gel and paint it onto your body and there you go. Or, you can leave it undyed and just brush it onto your skin. You can't see it. It becomes like body armor. If someone tries to grab hold of you, boom! 
The force of the explosion is directed outward away from the person wearing it, so the wearer isn't hurt at all. It's actually pretty cool to witness. Thomasina returned from the pools and dipped her damp fingers into the powder, examining it closely. And this is stable? She asked, rubbing her thumb and fingers together. Oh yeah, I guess it takes a little practice to determine how much force is required to set it off. But it's stable enough that they don't accidentally blow themselves up. Not that I've seen anyway. Cool, huh? I'm planning on copying this stuff and producing it myself when I get home. I'll make a fortune with this shit. Oh, from your jail cell? Is that what you're going to do? Thomasina asked. Clara seated herself next to Thomasina and grabbed a brush, eager to put some powder on. King... Thomasina asked, Will you please take this woman and dunk her into the water? I want to make certain she's not wearing any of this powder. What? Clara squealed. Why can't I have powder? Because we don't trust you. King came up and lifted Clara off her feet. Hey, w wait a minute. Let me go. You're not still sore about the finger as a hootie thing, are you? King said nothing. He carried Clara out over the pools and dunked her several times. She splashed and coughed. While Clara was getting dunked, Philip took the opportunity to attend to Alana. He tore up several linens and treated her wound, dabbing away the blood. With the rest of the linens, he tied her up. He was pretty good at it, having plenty of practice tying Sarah up when they were younger to see if she could free herself. He got to the point where even the unrestrainable Sarah couldn't escape. He finished and pushed her into a corner. King dumped Clara onto the floor, soaking wet. The sack she was wearing was bloated with water. She miserably Miserably coughed. I lost my shoes, she sputtered. King, please retrieve Clara's shoes, Philip said. King went out over the pools and dove in. Philip found a towel for her to dry herself. She took it and winked at him. Thanks she purred. King returned and dropped her soaked shoes on top of her. Thomasina stood. She had filled a small chest with aboleth powder. It sounds interesting. We'll take some to analyze later, she said. Philip, do you have room in your duster for this? She held the chest out. Certainly. He took the chest, ensured the lid was tightly closed, and placed it inside his coat. Clara was furious. So I can't have any aboleth? No, Thomasina said. They exited the bathing room, Clara still sopping wet and muttering to herself. At the far end of the bedchamber was an untried wooden door. What's on the other side of that door? Thomasina demanded. Clara refused to speak to her. She turned to Philip instead. There's a bunch of rooms outside. To the left is the treasure hoard. To the right is a service area housing a lot of filthy machinery. I think we're up in the air right now. Up a ways to the right is a hangar that opens to the outside. She keeps a big floating skiff where she puts all her potions and nasty stuff. Sort of like a big trunk you take with you on vacation. Wherever she goes, it goes. So if the skiff is gone, then she's not here. What about the Manx? Philip asked. I've never seen any of them in here. But she's got this hideous robot out there. It sort of wanders around, checking the hoard and the machinery. It's all it does. I've never seen it do anything else. Gives me the chills, though. Is it dangerous? Thomasina asked. Probably. I don't know. King, go out and have a look. Be careful, Philip said. Cautiously, they opened the door and King fluttered out. They waited for him to return. So how much am I getting paid for this help? Clara asked as they waited. Paid? You get to live. Thomasina replied. I get to live anyway. Your man isn't going to kill me, and I'm pretty sure he's not going to let you kill me either. So what am I getting paid? I want this silver bird. He's pretty useful. I got a little workshop back home where I reverse engineer arcane items and reproduce them. I'm actually pretty good at it. That finger of Zahudi I was using to dominate your demon's will? I replicated that myself. My goal is to replicate the other nine fingers as well when I get my hands on them. And I'll take a pot full of abalone. That stuff's gonna make me and what's left of my house a lot of money. Philip spoke up. We're not killers, and we appreciate what you did getting the door to the blood box open. You're not gonna be killed. However, you're not gonna be paid either, Lady Wonderluck. You're going back to Magistrate Kylo's cell to await trial. Maybe, once everything's said and done, I'll do what I can to get you a speedy trial and testify on your behalf. My name is Clara. Philip, she said, defiant. Philip, are you forgetting this woman and her foul brothers tried to murder Sam and Sarah? And she is personally responsible for us getting stuck here in the first place, Thomasina said. Gah! She hissed in frustration. Clara 
Jafar crossed her arms and moped. King returned. Alert, he said. Outside is a plush hallway lined with chambers filled with treasure, including a botanical area and a horde of live animals. A throne room is situated at the end of the hallway. To the right is a maintenance area and power plant. I encountered no one outside. No servants or manx present. Queen Gome is also not present. The skiff Lady Wonderluck mentioned appears to be housed in a small hangar with an armored door leading to the outside. Neither skiff nor trunk are currently present in the hangar. Told you, Clara said. What about that robot she mentioned, Philip asked. I did not see a robot, King replied. Where'd it go? Clara asked. They opened the door and went out. Outside was a hallway padded in light blue silks and encased in gold. A thick carpet woven with golden threads ran the length of the corridor. I hate this carpet, Clara said. They always make me take my shoes off and wash my feet before stepping on it. I'm gonna get it good and dirty. She rubbed her heels into the pile. She whispered into Philip's ear. I got pretty feet, Philip. Philip smiled. She never quit. She was still fishing for an opportunity, searching for an angle and a card to play. He whispered back into her ear. Sorry, roses are prettier. They crept out into the corridor. The sound of machinery at work was markedly pronounced, much more so than in the bedroom. The whisper-like breathing of a great steam engine hissed all around them. They felt the floor beneath them trembling. To the left was a line of finely crafted doors. To the right was a dark, smoky service area. I would assume the Chadburn will go out in the service area somewhere, Philip said. I think I know where it goes, Clara said. This way. They headed to the right. The carpeted hallway ended, and a hard, bare metal floor began. A spacious hangar area opened up to the left. It was clean and well-organized, with space to house a vehicle 50 feet in length. The floor space where the vehicle would go was conspicuously empty. Past the hangar was a vast, dirty mechanical area. A basin filled with clean water to wash one's feet was placed off to the side. Past the basin, iron steps went down to a central gantry, passing over a hot, dark region covered in rust and soot. There were pipes ducted every which way. Giant, riveted tanks strapped to the wall sloshed with uncountable gallons of water stored within. Before them was a grand industrial dance. Machinery and linkages, gears meshed together, spinning flywheels, pistons rising and falling in regular puffs of steam, moving massive armatures in precise order. Giant furnaces blazing hot were lined up like massive pistons hills, and steam chests wheezed steadily, filling the open space with an oppressive humidity laced with smoke. The rusty gantry they stood on snaked precariously through the center of the machinery. To fall off the gantry would mean certain death, chewed up in the teeth of turning gears or scalded in cones of steam. Philip took it all in. Who maintains all of this? I would think a setup this size would require an army of craftsmen performing constant maintenance. I've never seen anybody working on this equipment. It runs itself. Don't be fooled by all the rust. It covers up an arcane heart. I'd know it anywhere, Clara said. The only thing I've ever seen out here is the robot. Are you certain? Philip asked. It's always been out here or back in the horde, she replied. Thomasina looked around. I don't see anything. Describe it. What should we be looking for? Clara scratched her head. It's weird. It's 15 or 20 feet long. It's shaped sort of like a bowling pin. You know bowling, that game you Vith love so much but won't admit it. It moves about on rails and can move fast when it wants to. I can't ever tell if it has a back end or a front end. It sort of slides around in any direction it wants. And it makes this fog bottom mumbling sound that gives me the chills. That was too noisy in here to pick up the sound. It's also covered in rust, so I guess it blends in pretty well. They looked around the vast area again, Philip and King lighting their sight. They saw nothing. The robot could be hiding anywhere. King, Philip asked, can you take a look from the heights and tell us what you see? Be careful. King flapped up towards the lofty metal ceiling, panning about the cones of his sight, cutting through the steamy haze. Anything? Philip called up. I see... Something happened. One moment King was there, the next he was snatched out of midair and gone at withering speed. King! 
Thomasina soared into the steamy heights with the Chadburn at the ready, hoping to come to his aid. At that moment, a great red shape came sliding down from between ribs of machinery. It approached in a fast, somewhat predatory fashion, moving along the walls, shooting past Thomasina. She took a broad, whooshing swing at it, but missed. That's it! Clara shouted. That's the robot! It was ruddy and quite plain to look at, with red jewels encrusted in the center of its body at four equal distant points. It was attached to the walls from the front and the back via sturdy jointed legs, sliding on rails, and as Clara had noted, it did look pretty much like a bowling pin. It made a disquieting mumbling sort of sound coming from deep within. Red and black streaks of rust and soot crusted on the construct's capsule stood out in bold strata-like hues. As it approached the plush carpeted area, it passed through a tube. The rusty capsule around it was left behind in the tube, revealing a gleaming clean shell of blue metal. The robot then proceeded past them out of the service area and entered the carpeted hallway, sliding on a central rail built into the ceiling. Clara watched it depart. I'll bet it thinks your demon is a piece of horror trying to escape. We must get him back. Come on, Philip said as Thomasina rejoined them. They turned, following the robot. Despite her bravado, Clara took a moment to wash her feet in the basin before stepping on the carpet. Habit, she said. Down the hallway was an impossible collection of treasure. There were chambers filled with piles of gold, with platinum of ghostly luster, with silver, with antimony, cadmium, and other precious metals struck into coins, shaped into bars, and melted into nuggets of extraordinary size. Crystal vases overflowed with sparkling jewels of mouth-watering color. There were rooms stacked high with rare fabrics made on forgotten looms, while fabulous jewelry in indescribable configurations peeked out of open drawers. Each chamber contained more jaw-dropping wealth than the last. There wasn't a central lighting system in the chambers. The treasure generated its own ephemeral light. And then there were the collections of rare items wrought in exquisite beauty. There were scrolls of golden parchment, wands, glyphs, brooches, robes, gowns, armor, shields, swords, innumerable types of guns and other firearms, bits of arcane technology, and wondrous machines. The wealth collected over the centuries was mind-boggling. There were stacks of paintings created by nameless masters and sculptures of pure perfection. Menageries of rare and extinct beasts pacing in cages went on for as far as the eye could see. Water and fire seemed to be created by the horde in endless quantities quantities, pumped and ducted away to fuel the machinery at the front of the bower chest. Philip and Thomasina took everything in in silence. The robot turned and entered a chamber housing a host of arcane creatures. Big ones, little ones, two-legged, three-legged, four-legged, and more. Horned toads, fiery salamanders, and pacing tigers. The collection seemed endless. The robot stopped in the center of the room. A panel in its capsule opened. Out came a hinged metal arm. It selected an empty silver cage from a shelf and took the cage into itself. A few moments later... A cage was brought back out, only this time King was confined within it. The robot gently placed the cage back on the shelf. We're gonna get you out of there, King, Philip said. The robot seemed to go dead. It sat motionless on the ceiling. Thomasina puzzled. Well, what's it? Before she could finish her sentence, the robot moved. In a blur, panels opened and metal arms shot out. The robot plucked the box containing Lady Crisania's parts out of Philip's hands and the Chadburn from Thomasina's securing both items within its capsule before they could react. It turned to Philip and Thomasina, though it had no eyes, it glared at them, aggressively moving fast in their direction. The mumbling within its body rose in pitch to a terrifying scream. An arm emerged, tipped with a whirling blade, whipping the air in a frenzy. It went for Philip. He dove aside, the blades missing. He raised his poltava and fired. No effect. The robot advanced on them, brandishing its whirling blades. Free me from this cage, King said. The robot was between them and the imprisoned King. It went for Philip again. Missed. 
Thomasina wrenched Philip by the shoulders and dragged him across the floor, taking flight. She flew into the hallway. Philip, we've no room and nothing to fight with. Moments later, the robot was there, gleaming, sliding on its rail, blades turning, flying as fast as she could. Thomasina soared down the hallway with Philip in her arms. The robot came after them and was quickly gaining. Panels opened, more arms came out, and more deadly blades whirled. Casually, Clara, forgotten and unnoticed by the robot, came striding out of the chamber moments later. She held the cage containing King over her head. Betrayed, King said from his cage. You have been betrayed. Clara was jubilant. You're all mine now, baby doll, she said to King. Sorry, suckers. Looks like I'm not heading back to the crappy cell in your crappy village, am I? You bunch of rumple pumps. Have fun with the vith, you stinking robot. She turned and fled in the opposite direction. Philip fired at the robot until his potava emptied. The robot was undamaged. Why is it after us? Thomasina cried. Clara had said Gome's robot attacked those attempting to steal from the horde and that it ignored all others. Philip had a thought and slapped at his duster pockets. Sure enough, Several platinum coins jangled about his duster, placed there on the sly by the treacherous Clara Wonderluck. He pulled the coins out and threw them aside. The robot immediately stopped, opened panels, and retrieved the coins. At last, they reached the end of the hallway and entered the great throne room of Queen Gome. Shaped from pure gold, her molten throne unoccupied. Overhead, Lanterns hung from chains of brilliant luster. Exotic plants in all colors drank up pure water from the channels that emptied into clear, shallow pools. Lily pads floated on the water. Large white flowers with golden stalks jutted up out of the pools. Nearby, in a prominent place, were two earthen footers atop an elevated platform. Thomasina soared across the room, looking for an exit and finding none. Philip were trapped and defenseless. She had a thought and touched ground. Give me the chest of Abeleth. Philip pulled it from his duster. We have no idea what this substance will do. Thomasina took it and opened the lid. No time like now to find out. She pulled her gloves off and dipped her hands in. The robot burst into the throne room a few moments later. More panels opened in its chest. The robot reached into the hollow and pulled out two female heads disembodied at the neck. The heads moved and throbbed with a hideous unlife. Their mouths opened and closed, emitting cold yellow light. They murmured in dead sorrow. Two more arms emerged from the robot's body. The arms ended in a length of wire like a cat nine tail. The robot spun the wire around, picking up speed until it whirled about like a deadly buzzsaw. The robot held the heads aloft and came at Thomasina and Philip. Philip pulled his remaining sap and formed it into a shield, protecting Thomasina as she applied the powder to her hands. The blades and serrated wire slammed into the sap shield, Philip straining to hold them back. Hurry, Rose! He cried, feeling the blades cutting through the shield. Her hands covered in aboleth powder, Thomasina launched herself into the air. For all and my husband, she yelled as she spiraled towards the robot. Thomasina attacked. The robot's arms created a barrage of razors and deadly wire, all whipping this way and that. At full speed, she dove past a cloud of wire toward the robot's body. It flailed about, fishing through the air, hoping to hit her. Her life depended on Queen Gome's Aboleth powder. If it failed, then she would die. She reached the disembodied heads, having no idea how effective the powder would be, if at all. She punched out with her hands. Boom. Boom. The aboleth coating her fists functioned marvelously. The explosions blasted the hands into bloody nothingness in an orange flash of fire. She turned her attention to the robot itself. Philip's Poltava had proved useless against the robot's capsule, but the power of the aboleth bit through like a cutting torch, blasting large holes in its metal shell with each hit. With just a few blows, Thomasina worked her way into its inner, unarmored mechanisms. A few more hits, more flashes of smoke, and she blew the guts out of the robot. It went still, hanging lifeless from the ceiling. The wire clattered to a stop. Rose, Philip said as he approached, still holding his tattered sap shield. She crawled out of the ruined metal remains and embraced him. Are you hurt? He asked. I'm fine. She looked at her hands. 
I must admit, this Aboleth powder is stunning. Absolutely stunning. It's potent and energetic. It cuts through armor like it's not even there. And all the while, my hands are undamaged. Philip dug through the remains of the robot, going deep inside its ruined body. He found the box containing Lady Crisania's parts. The box and the parts within were slightly scorched from the Aboleth blast, but still intact. Further back was the Chadburn. Its armored shutter closed. He dug it out and gave it to Thomasina. Let's go get King, he said, holding the box. They exited the room, moving fast down the corridor. Rose, I think Queen Gome intends to place the machine in her throne room back there. I saw two hard point footings made of earth, just like it sits upon the earth in the grove. And they're in the correct distance apart, the right size. Like Sarah said, she wants the machine in her throne room available for her easy use. We cannot let her have it. They passed a closed chamber to their left, glancing inside through a small window. Thomasina saw that the room within was empty save for a copper bowl placed on a pedestal. Pedestal. The bowl overflowed with alluring golden dust piled up like a snow cone. The dust was scintillating, glinting with power and untold possibilities, generating its own light like the first rays of dawn. Of all the treasure hoarded here, none seemed greater than this bowl full of dust. Philip, look, what's that? She tried the door. It was locked. We tell stories of the urn of life in Wham, the urn of a goddess taken by force of arms and lost. Could this be it? We'll come back for it, Rose, Philip said. First, we recover King. They continued on. Ahead, a door to the right of the corridor swung ajar. There was the uh, posh interior of Queen Gome's bedroom again. They heard a commotion going on in the washing area. Inside was Clara Wonderluck. She stood there before Queen Gome's boudoir, biting her lip, big-eyed and somewhat sheepish. A cloth bag stuffed full of pots of aboleth powder lay at her feet. She blushed. I, uh, yeah, I was just collecting some powder and... King was sitting on her left shoulder, his gleaming beak poised at her neck. On the tiled floor were the twisted remains of the silver cage he had been confined in. Naturally, I escaped, King said. Thomasina charged forward. You're gonna Die right now, Wonderluck, she roared. Clara held her hands out in a defensive manner. Oh no, 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 wait! Thomasina plowed into her, knocking Clara down, rousting King from his perch. Ow! No, no, please, I I'm sorry! Clara cried. Her eyes grew wide. Hey, do you have Aboleth on your hands? Don't hit me, it'll blow! That's the whole idea, you little scoundrel. Be silent and face your death with a bit of dignity, Thomasina roared. Clara struggled and crawled around. She pleaded to Philip as he seemed to be the only one around slightly sympathetic to her cause. Wait, Phil Philip, please. I'm sorry. What did you expect me to do? You said I was going back to the jail and stay there until I'm an old hag. Why would I want to do that? Wouldn't you do the same? You would. You wouldn't just let yourself get hauled off to jail. I figured you'd beat the robot. I just wanted to get away. That's all. Stop. Thomasina was trying to prop Clara up into a kneeling position so she could blow her head off with the powder. But Clara was having none of it. She managed to get a hold of Thomasina's leg and pulled her down, the two momentarily struggling on the floor. As Sarah had previously found out, Clara was much tougher than she looked and wasn't going down without a fierce struggle. King fluttered up to Philip's shoulder. Shall I dispatch her? He asked. Philip waded in and grabbed Clara by the neck, pulling her up. Enough. Clara gasped and sputtered for breath. Wide-eyed, she stared up at him. I really don't know why. But I'm going to let you live, he said. Philip, no, Thomasina cried, standing. We are not cold-blooded killers, Rose. And nor are we executioners. He locked eyes with Clara. Lady Wonderluck, allow me to pay you a compliment. You've shown quite a bit of spirit, good pair of hands, and a never-quit attitude. And I admire that. I suppose I see a little bit of my sister in you. Despite the fact you are also a shameless opportunist, who would say or do anything the moment required to better your situation? You are a fanatic, a casual murderer, a liar, and an unprincipled, untrustworthy bore. As you determined, I have been taught the whole of my life to value the life of a lady, even if she does not value mine or that of my wife. No, no, that's not what I was doing, Philip. I helped you. I... Philip shushed her. Shh, quiet. Do not confuse our compassion with weakness, for that would be a deadly mistake. Now then, you are going to lead us to the control area. You shall do so promptly, without diversion, and you shall not utter another word until we say you may speak again. 
If you say anything, or if you make any unwise moves, King shall pierce you through the heart. Do you understand? She opened her mouth to speak. No, no, Philip said. No talking. Do you understand? She nodded vigorously. Excellent. Whether you live or die depends entirely on you. Now then, lead the way. Thomasina shook her head. Gods, Philip, you're showing much more charity than I would have. But that's one of the reasons I love you. King perched on Clara's shoulder, ready to run her through. Thomasina applied more Abilef powder to her hands. She then filled the chest to the lid and took it with her. And with that, we conclude part three, chapter five, Gomes' bedroom. Yeah, this was a fun chapter, and I had planned on Thomasina trying something at some point, and this interior with the robot gave me the chance to do so. I figured the robot has a precise knowledge of every bit of treasure Queen Gom has in there, and, and it will guard this treasure down to the smallest coin. It captured King, probably because it didn't know what it was, and it thought maybe it could give it to Queen Gome as a gift or let her inspect it and see if she would want to add it to her whores. That's why he captured it. He knew King wasn't part of the treasure. And I figured Clara, as a sly customer, would have grabbed a few coins and slid them into one of their pockets. And Philip has his big duster, so it was pretty simple for a pickpocket like Clara to do that undetected. And as soon as she did that, then that was on. Then the, the robot was fully aware that treasure was in Philip's pocket and it was was going to destroy the both of them. Fortunately, this Aboleth powder that we were introduced to works pretty well. And it, like Clara said, it's like body armor for the most part. They paint it on. You can't really see it. Or sometimes they, they dye it festive colors and put it in little dots on their hands. And they, they can use it to really good effect. They can blow holes in just about anything. They can blow your head off and not hurt themselves in the process. It's pretty cool stuff. I come up with the Aboleth a while back. This is finally my excuse to use it. We're going to be seeing a lot more of that. Don't worry. We're just beginning with this Aboleth stuff. They recover, kill the robot, get their stuff back, get King, and have recaptured Clara. And now they're heading deeper into the depths of the Bower chest. Now, next chapter, chapter six, is called The Valley of Forgotten Dreams. And that's only a few pages long. I might do the next chapter after that, which is called Queen Gum. Finally, we're going to actually get to the lady herself. We've been waiting for it for the entire book. And here she comes in two chapters. So the next one, The Valley of Forgotten Dreams, is fairly short. We might move on to Queen Gum, But that one's pretty long. I don't know if I want to combine those two. Any event, that is next week. Until then, this is Ren Presents. I am your host, Ren. Peace out. Thank <laughs> you.